there I was crawled back into my cave and just accepting the fact that I was going to have to go through chemotherapy. My days were numbered. It, it was a, a dark place and, and just almost a resignation that this is the end. It's one thing when somebody else gets a diagnosis, but when you personally get the diagnosis, in, in my life, the future just disappeared. All of a sudden, what life I had left, which I thought was maybe 15 years, shrunk down to month, maybe just months, I didn't know. Okay, well, I've um, been married to my wife since 1970, so that makes 50, 52 years. And so she's a, a long suffering lady and she's, we alternate being caregivers, but um, couldn't have done it without her. We had five children. And uh, when you have children, you're a hostage for the rest of your life. So uh, uh, we, <laughs> every day she's got to check on them. I also was a youth minister, served in several churches. And then uh, later on, I uh, was a volunteer music minister, directing choirs and leading music in a church. So music is one of my real loves, having grown up singing in choirs, playing in a trombone in the band, and picking up the guitar. So uh, I'm, I worked for electric utility 40 years. My training was electrical engineering. I went to school in South Texas. And um, that was kind of growth out of my hobby, which was ham radio. And... Uh, so this has been an interest of mine for all these years. That is so sweet. Um, wow, she sounds amazing. And um, I love the fact that you pointed to the, you know, 52 years. Um, <laughs> the, the ham radio is another thing that I, I love. You were just saying this morning, you were talking to somebody else somewhere in another part of the country. Yes, this morning I, I had insomnia about uh, two o'clock. And so I knew some guys were talking and I went out to, into my ham shack and uh, talked to them. Uh, and first time I'd actually talked to them, but I told them I had been listening to them for, for 10 years. And I said, uh, when I was diagnosed with blood cancer, it meant a lot to me to be able to, to get some normalcy by listening to you guys in the middle of the night when I was laying awake worrying about my disease. So uh, th that meant a lot to me to bring some uh, normalcy into, into my life. I, you just long for that um, your life has changed forever when you're diagnosed with cancer. So uh, that was my chance to say thank you to those guys this morning. I'm curious, what was their response hearing something like that? It was it said, you know, hey, everybody out here, this is Lynn's first time. Say hi to him. So I was hearing voices and people giving their call signs from different locations. So uh, I certainly did feel welcome. And I uh, had had witnessed their um, their companionship, the, the type of camaraderie, what's the right word there? I, I, I so appreciate you, you opening up and sharing that. Let's dive into your story then. We're winding back to 2013, and I do understand that there may have been some symptoms before, but really in 2013 is when it all sort of came to a head. Can you describe what those first symptoms were that you were feeling? Yes, I I began to run fever uh, with no known cause, which was not a new thing, but it, it prolonged. It lasted day after day after day, went on for a week. And so I said, okay, I don't know what it is, but I wanna go see my primary care physician. And I, uh, I was having some night sweats along with that too, but, but I was meticulously keeping the record of the, the daily temperature. And so um, I actually saw the nurse practitioner but he had a lot of experience and he said, let's just do a, get a chest x-ray and see where we go from there. Well, then the, then the uh, call came from the doctor's office after they got the chest x-ray. Uh, they said, he also now wants you to go get a CAT scan. Well, that, the alarm bells went off then. I said, well, 
what did they see on the cat on the x-ray something's going on here so uh, anyway i went and got the pet scan and and then then i had the appointment the next week with with him to see what he what he saw and he said well it appears that uh, you may have a type of lymphoma but uh, uh, we don't know but you need to go see an oncologist and so that's that's how things evolved at that, that point. Right. And it, it happened so quickly. Right. And by the way, you had mentioned um, it was a week long fever. You ha- you had night sweats as well. Is that true? Yes, I had some night sweats with that. I didn't know what to think about that. You know, is that is this just a part of the fever or what? Yeah. And, it, and, and I wanted to ask a little bit more because people hear about night sweats and it can be hard when you're you know feeling something like is this just the Texan weather. I don't know. <laughs> is this, yeah. you know, is it the fever? Like, what is it? And, but for you, it was enough moisture that it, it was different than usual, right? It, it was. And it would, I would find that it would get much worse uh, in the coming months. I, I found that it would be to the degree where the, where your night clothes were drenched and the sheet underneath you was drenched. And uh, so I, I would sometimes have to get up and and uh, change change clothes, underclothes, and then then the spot on the bed would be too wet to, to lie back down on. So it it, it was it was, uh, and then and through all that, I didn't want to wake my wife up. And and so we are in a pretty dry climate out here in West Texas, so things would dry out pretty quickly. So as the months went on, it got worse, and it was really you were drenched in night sweat. You know, thankfully that first doctor said or nurse practitioner said let's get a scan going. You got a CT scan. And then a week later, you got a bone marrow biopsy um, and you went through the whole thing. So first Lynn, it it was when it went from x-ray to CT scan. Can you describe what that felt like? You know, x-rays don't raise an alarm. You know, you just kind of like, oh yeah, I've had a lot of x-rays. But um, when they said we want a chest x-ray, a chest CAT scan, well, I've never had a chest CAT scan. Something is going on. And and I try to compartmentalize that, try to put it off to the side, but but it's there. It's just nagging and, and uh, you're knowing something's not right. I, you know, the, the next week I went in to get the report from the, the, the nurse practitioner there, the primary care physician. And, and uh, when he, he said what he said, I think you've got lymphoma. I went home and told my wife and she didn't believe me because I'm always joking and, and pulling pranks on her and, and things like that. So she didn't believe me when I went and told her. So, um, and so I, I had to insist that, you know, that it was true. And she, she really um, stepped up to bat because I withdrew into my cave. She began to, to research and print things out off the internet and I didn't want to read them. And uh, of course I had the upcoming appointment with the, oncologist and, uh, and and the bone marrow biopsy. And when I got there, he said we can, uh, or she said we can, we can do a uh, biopsy of your lymph nodes, but the, they're all internal. So it's gonna be a little more difficult uh, to, to get to, to them. Uh, and we need to uh, do a bone marrow biopsy and we can, we can assess from that what type of cancer this is. And so then when the report came back on that, uh, and, and she said, this is small lymphocytic lymphoma, which is kin to chronic lymphocytic leukemia, except this is primarily in the lymph nodes and, and not, not detectable at this stage in your blood. Um, and what I would recommend is that you be treated with RCHOP. And uh, so my, my wife, uh, and, and we remember the acronyms from when, when our son had cancer, we remember the acronyms and that they had meetings and, and we recognized some of the drugs that, that she mentioned that I would be treated with. And um, so I, I, was, I w- went home with that feeling that my days are numbered. Of course, I've always known my days were numbered, but I said, they're very short. And so I went home with, with, the, with um, the thought that, well, I gotta go through this, you know, and uh, Within a day or so, of course, my wife contacted the children, the key grown, the grown adults, and told them what was going on. And she came back and said, "The kids and I want you to go to MD Anderson." There I was, crawled back into my cave and just accepting the fact that I was going to have to go through chemotherapy. My days were numbered, 
it, it was a, a dark place and, and just almost a resignation that this is the end. And my wife came and still I had not read any literature. I had not looked on the internet. I was scared of what I would see. And so my wife came and of course she had printed some things out that I didn't want to see. But she said, the kids want you to go to MD Anderson. Uh, and of course, with our history, with our son having had cancer back in the 70s, we, knew, we were familiar with it at MD Anderson. We knew it was the right place to go. I knew it was the right place to go. But I just felt so lousy, didn't feel good, didn't want, didn't want to make the 400 mile trip. But uh, she stepped up as the caregiver and called MD Anderson and made an appointment. Didn't even get a referral, just made an appointment and said, you're going to, you've got you all lined up. We're going to go down there and, and we'll, we're going to go there in a week and a half. So uh, that's, and before, before you go there, I mean, that's incredible. I'm so glad that she stepped up like that for you, but you had described yourself as, you know, you've been this optimistic person, upbeat, um, a go-getter, I think from everything I've heard. And I'd love for you to, if you would, uh, delve into what it was in that moment of course, everyone knows it's it's going to be lousy to be to be diagnosed with cancer. But what was it that um, you were really feeling, and and if you could just describe that for us? You know, with with the diagnosis, uh, I mean, it's one thing when somebody else gets a diagnosis, but when you personally get the diagnosis, in in my life, the future just disappeared. The, the dreams, even even at that age of sixty six. The dreams I had of being a granddad and and what was to come and, and things to enjoy as I was newly retired, those all vanished. And and all of a sudden, what life I had left, which I thought was maybe 15 years, shrunk down to month, maybe just months. I didn't know, and I but I certainly knew I felt didn't feel good, and something something was wrong. I mean, the doctors were right. I I did not feel well. And you had, I don't know if this came up for you, but I mean, you have worked your whole life and you had done everything right, you know, if you will, and you had just retired and was something about this too, like, Hey, I'm just starting to really <laughs> go and live my life. And I have so many things that I'm looking forward to. Yeah, we, we uh, had retired uh, where I was working in West Texas out in the country uh, on uh, six acres. And so, uh, I mean, there was a, a stench of area to mow and, and uh, but there were things we were involved in we were involved with our church and we were uh, joining with an acoustic group of musicians uh, singing at the rest home but it was like all of a sudden you're sick and you need to stay away from people and and when I saw people it was like I was not one who held it back uh, or didn't share the, my diagnosis I, I shared that with other people but, but all of a sudden it's like you're marked. And, um, and I felt marked. I felt like I'm here and I just want to tell you that I've got this diagnosis of, of lymphoma, small lymphocytic lymphoma. Of course, nobody knew what that was. Uh, it, it is a, a rare disease, just uh, like its counterpart, CLL, the rare diseases. And Lynn, when you say you felt marked, can you describe that too? Well, goodness, we've all been through that in our life where somebody we knew was diagnosed with a terminal disease. And um, the, you have different reactions. Some people, well, the, the, those that, when you hear that, you don't know how to respond to that person um, or to their family. Sometimes you, you're asking their family members, how are they doing? Because you, you're you uncomfortable asking that person how they're doing. And uh, we've seen through our life experiences that some people, withdraw from you. Some people that uh, have been friends, it's, they don't know how to cope with it. So they pull back. So, uh, but, but it, I myself, I was pulling back too. So uh, difficult time. And, and, and Lynn, you had also just mentioned this, you know, small uh, lymphocytic uh, lymphoma, people not understanding what that is you had to understand too what that was. And also when we first hear about cancer, a lot of us think about the acute cancer, not the chronic cancer. So how was it processing what that really meant? Well, after I finally saw the specialist at MD Anderson and, and uh, the, the phrase that he told, he said to me, 
that had brought hope back in my life. He said that um, we can't cure this disease, but we can manage it. Well, all of a sudden the glass for, glass for me was half full again. It was not half empty. And, and I found that to be, uh, to bring hope to my life. And um, that, that just, uh, and on that trip we made to MD Anderson, I decided to start looking for things that were humorous again, find things to laugh about. And as I stood there in the medical clinic at MD Anderson, and I looked at the list of doctors and, and saw the names on that list, um, I began to laugh because one of the doctor's names was Dr. Finale. Uh, he was not my doctor, but uh, that was one of the doctors. And the doctor at the top of the list, the one in charge was Dr. K-W-A-K, Dr. Quack. And uh, so I had to take a picture of that and post it on my Facebook page to let folks know that I was finding, I was finding things to laugh about again. We, we, stopped, we stopped and ate in a restaurant and of course um, camo or camouflage type dress is common in Texas. And uh, I looked over there and saw these folks with the camouflage and uh, it made me think of the, the TV show, uh, the guys in, in Louisiana that uh, have the, the, the duck calls, that sell the duck calls. I thought about them. So, so things like that were, were bringing humor back to my life. You know, before you got there, I know going from talking about where you were in this really pretty dark space um, after getting diagnosed and feeling like, how much longer do I have? And then finally getting to MD Anderson and I saw the emotion there in the words, just what, what your, your, onco your, that oncologist said, that hematologist oncologist said, which was, we can't cure this, but we can manage it. Can you, can you just describe and explain the power of those words and and what, what came up for you there as you were thinking back to that moment for you? Well, uh, yeah, when I think back to that, I, I think I was thinking he was going to say, you know, we, we can just buy you some time. Um, but he turned it in a positive way to say that we can manage it. I did not have any comprehension of the research that was going on that was going to begin to explode uh, in the treatment of CLL and SLL, which certainly has exploded in the last 10 years and would bring so much uh, hope for people that are diagnosed with those diseases. Uh, I, uh, I mean, to that point, the treatment was going to be chemotherapy. Um, and, but, but as we sat down and talked, the doctor and I did, and my, and my wife was with me and our son was with me, and he said, let me just talk to you about some of the treatment options. Um, and We've got the traditional chemotherapy that we can treat you with, or we can treat you with some novel therapies, targeted therapies. And so uh, we began to see that there were some, some other options. And, and so now we're up into the time frame of November and he's ready to start treatment because my blood counts, because I've got 70% um, involvement in my bone marrow, my blood counts are beginning to drop. And, um, the, the B symptoms, as they say, would, would be getting worse. And uh, of course, losing weight and the fevers and, and the night sweats. But he, he gave the option to, to start treatment in December. And I said, how about, you said that this is a, a disease that we don't have to treat right away. We can defer. How about if we start in January? I would like to enjoy Christmas. And so that's the way that took place. We, we went we, we went back to MD Anderson. And of course, at this point, we're going to MD Anderson uh, every every month. And that, now I digress a little bit, but you, you go from where you're comfortable, the doctors you're comfortable with, and you go to the big city and you go to the parking garages and you go to the freeways. And and all that is, is to me was, you know, like a maze. And, and uh, as we age, we're not as capable of, of negotiating those kind of uh, traffic jams and problems you have, but um, uh, it's like a great sigh of relief came when you got the car parked and uh, stop and take a picture of the parking lot number so that you remember where your car is when you, when you get ready to come back to your car. So uh, 
Yeah, we we were having CAT scans and we had, I had PET scans and bone marrow biopsies and blood work. And I'm sure at some point in there, I, mean, I had x-ray and then at some point in there, I'm sure I had an EKG. They wanted to, to be, be sure that uh, the kind of drugs they were giving me would not interfere with that. But so there we were in going to start in January and that we discussed the options and it was chemotherapy or novel therapy. And the doctor said, we've got uh, two drugs that have had some benefit for this type of cancer. And one of them is Revlimid. The other name for that is lenalidomide. It's a common treatment for multiple myeloma. And the other drug is Rituxan. And of course those didn't mean much to me because I had not really, it, it, that's, a, that's an interesting thought as you're a new patient. Some folks have a long uh, watch and wait. And during that time they can research and see what the, the different drugs are and what the, how they interact and so forth. But I was, I was, I was so naive that the Rituxan went in on an IV. So I thought that meant I was actually getting chemo. I didn't understand that it was a monoclonal antibody and it was not, not chemo. So I, I got uh, Rituxan and Revlimid and, um, and we stayed and I was getting the Rituxan IV every week. So we stayed there locally and we were going back every week to get another infusion. This stretched out for about a month. And then after that, I was coming, we were coming monthly for the IV and for, um, and, and of course to get a refill on my, my pills, which were the Revlimid. But at the three month mark from the time we started, the doctor said, it's time to, to do a CAT scan and see if this is working. And so the results came back and we sat down with him and that was in, in April of um, 2014. And he said, okay, what we're seeing is no difference. And I, I said, well, that's good, isn't it? I mean, they haven't grown. Here I am, the guy with the glass half full of water. And he said, no, no, that, that means we need to try something else. And so he said, there's a new drug that was just approved by the FDA and, but it, it's approved for second line therapy. Well, I had failed Revlimid and Rituxan, so I, I was ready for second line therapy. And so we began with, uh, again, repeating the Rituxan every week and then stretching it to every month and taking the Abrutinib every day. So that's how that all started uh, in April of 2014. Wow. And and uh, eight years later, over eight years later, you're still you're still on a Brutinib or Imbruvica, right? That's right. I'm still taking my daily pill. As I say, a pill a day keeps the cancer away. And uh, in, in some ways, it, to me, it's not too much different than the person who's a diabetic and has to get insulin every day or, or some other type of chronic disease. I, I choose to look at it in a positive way. I know I know that this may not work forever. I know it's got some side effects and we don't know for sure what the long, long term of side effects are. Those that were in clinical trial and God bless those folks because those pioneers that, that took this uh, and, and uh, were, they're the ones, some of them had worked for them and some of them didn't, but some of them it's still working and they're out to 10 years on this, on this drug. So they continue to bring me hope that uh, this will continue to work for me. And in the meantime, I'm on the very first of the BTK inhibitors of Rutinib. But since then, uh, there have been several other ones that have been developed, second generation, third generation, that have less side effects and bring uh, are easier for, for people to take. So uh, brings hope for other people. And besides that, there are other types of treatment that are targeted or novel, not, not chemo. They know now um, that that's probably not the best treatment, chemo and, and before Brutinib, the standard of treatment was FCR. And that still is the standard in probably in some other countries, but uh, fortunately in the US, uh, we're able to move on to other options. And, uh, you know, back in about 2015, here I am taking a Brutinib and I was at a patient power conference at MD Anderson and uh, Dr. Michael Keating, who's one of the pioneers of, of treatment and drugs uh, was answering questions. And uh, so I asked the, crew, the question, since um, a, a bone marrow uh, transplant or stem cell transplant is the, is the cure that we would have to lean on 
if everything else quits working. But at a certain point, we get too old to take that. Why don't we just do that up front? Why don't we get the stem cell transplant up front? And uh, he said, because these other drugs that you're taking have so let much less side effects, so much less risk. There's a lot of risk with it with a stem cell transplant, a bone marrow bi- transplant. So at that, you know, being able to go into those conferences like that, and as I began to, to read the blogs of other people, I read, was reading the blog of, of Brian Kaufman, Dr. Brian Kaufman, the CLL Society, and, and what uh, his journey was like and what was working for him. He was one of the pioneers of uh, Brutinib. Be able to be able to read those real life stories, just like you're creating with these videos, those, those gave me hope.